with some program updates. Oh, sorry. <laughs> okay, I'm just gonna repeat what I said. So today we're gonna go through. <laughs> today we're gonna go through the um, 2024 cost growth trend report. Uh, we're having our annual meeting coming up in June. Um, we will talk about public comment. Uh, we'll have public comment after the presentation, and then we'll have program updates after that. I want to give people a chance. Hopefully you, um, uh, Sarah, Sarah put the slides in the chat. I'll link to the slides in the chat so people can take a look at those um, if it's helpful. And then we'll obviously we'll be going through them um, or a combination of Sarah and team will be going through them today. I want us to think about a couple of things as we're heading into this, as we're going through this, as we're thinking about discussion at the end. The first thing I want us to think about is, are there things in here that we should be thinking about or incorporating into the annual meeting plan? Sort of what are your sort of key takeaways when you're looking at this? Ideas or thoughts around future sort of work or um, things that we should be considering or digging into. I think um, I just want to flag, I think that there's some folks who might be on the teams. So if a staff person can jump over to the yeah, teams. Yeah, I'm going to go over Zoom. and let them know uh, that it's in Zoom and give them the link. Okay, great. Thank you, Christy. <laughs> uh, okay, so are there any, um, I'm going to let, oh, Teresa. Yeah, you mentioned an email that went out over the weekend, but oh, no, there wasn't. Okay, all right, because I wasn't seeing anything. So um, <laughs> apologies, right. we did not send the slides out in advance for this meeting. So you did not miss anything. No. I'm okay. sorry, that was on us. Thank you. Sorry, that's my bad. I apparently got the slides so that I could facilitate this meeting <laughs> this, this morning. So um <laughs> Uh, but Sarah did post the agenda and the slides in the chat, so you do have them now for you. And if I'm correct, these all have been, because they're in a link, they've all been posted publicly now. So I want to encourage people to share them widely coming out of this meeting. And I know a lot of our health system folks will do that, but I also want to encourage our community partners if we could um, share them with people. Um, and then I think we're going to have a discussion of takeaways at the end of the uh, um, after the presentation. Is there any additions to that? Okay, so I think that there's a couple of things that I feel like are, um, Sarah, do you wanna do sort of the business stuff now around the changes to the board or do you wanna do it after the presentation? I think we were hoping to do that first to welcome everybody. Okay. Great. <laughs> um, okay. So I can we take down the slides so we can actually see faces. Christy might be on Teams. Okay, there we go. <laughs> Thank you. I love to see people's faces, even if it's their little pictures. Um, and I'm gonna email people who don't have little pictures after this to talk to tell them how to put little pictures up. But <laughs> Um, so we have some new additions to our board and some people who have transitioned off the board. So I think it would be good to go through and do a round of introductions. I think for the folks who have um, been on the who have been on the board, I think it might it's really helpful to say your name, um, where you work, and let's have our introduction question be your favorite thing about an Oregon summer. Since hopefully we are, we might be in fall summer, but I'm going to live that we're in Oregon summer. So, uh, and I guess I'm going to go through, um, I'm trying to think of the best way to do this. I'm going to go through and call people's names out. That way I make sure we get everybody. So um, on my list, we're going to start with Michael Anderson. The curse of a last name that starts with A. Um... Uh, hello all, my name is Michael Anderson AP and his pronouns. Um, I'm an independent consultant right now, uh, but have a background of working both in CCOs, uh, public health and nonprofits. 
um, and a lot around equity work. Um, and I, uh, yeah, excited to be here. I think, oh, favorite thing about Oregon summer, river time. Um, I love playing in the river with the family. So thank yeah. you. Thank you, Michael. Okay. Um, I might pronounce, mispronounce your names, Poonam. Hello. Uh, yeah, you're right. <laughs> you got it. <laughs> um, hi, my name is Poonam Chibber. I'm, I'm the medical director at uh, the Portland Clinic, uh, which is a multi-specialty clinic. Um, yeah, I'm really excited for this group. Um, my favorite activity for the summer is camping. Uh, love camping out here in summer. Um, really nice weather and you enjoy the like, especially around the rivers and all like it's so peaceful and so nice to spend time with the family. Melissa. Melissa might not be on yet. So uh, Jeremy Davis. Uh, I have to say my favorite thing about Oregon summers is just uh, the lake. Uh, and then just being in Eastern Oregon, there's just uh, so much to do outside. And Jeremy, can you tell us a little bit about where you work? Oh, yeah. Uh, Jeremy Davis. I'm the president and CEO for Grand Ronde Hospital and Clinics here in the Grand Oregon. Okay. Talk about a beautiful place, beautiful summer. Uh, Charlie. Hello. Good morning. Um, I'm Charlie Fisher. I'm the state director at Oscar. We're a statewide uh, public interest group with um, members around Oregon. Um, and that's such a hard question because there's so many great parts of Oregon summer. First thing that came to mind for me was that it's baseball season, so I get to waste a lot of my time watching baseball over the summer. Great. Uh, Jim. <clears throat> Thank you, Sarah. Uh, Jim Hauser, uh, co-founder of Hawthorne Auto Clinic, now retired, um, and also uh, a founding member of Main Street Alliance. Um, and uh, about the summer, um, summers typically have been week-long backpacking and hiking. And however, I'm no longer doing week week week-long backpacking, but I am head headed to the uh, Olympic National Park for a week of hiking starting next week. So that's really close to Oregon, and <laughs> that's as close as I can get. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, no, our brothers and sisters in Washington, come on. Katie. <laughs> Hi, I'm Katie Koenig with Oregon Business and Industry. And my favorite thing about summer is being in or near the water. Nice. I love this water trend. Herdesh. Is Herdesh on? He might be summering already. Okay. <laughs> We're going to go. Oh, Teresa. Hello, uh, Teresa Learn, a CFO with Care Oregon. And uh, my favorite thing about the Oregon summers are just like all the rest of you, just getting outside and going on hikes and biking and gardening and just enjoying the outdoors. So, Stefan. Yeah, hello, my name. Stefan Lindner, I'm at OHSU and as economist. Um, favorite thing about the summer is um, staying with the water theme is going to swimming pool. Another water, Gil. Hi, good morning. Um, Gil Munoz, uh, CEO of Virginia Garcia, he, him pronouns. Um, uh, I don't know if it counts, but uh, we like to go up to the San Juan Islands and kind of uh, uh, go, go around the, the different air, do some camping, cycling. Oops, I'm on mute. <laughs> I'm looking for, oh, Danielle might not be on, Jessica. Sorry, I couldn't get myself off mute. Uh, Jessica Richard, um, I work in uh, strategic finance uh, for Regents, Blue Cross, Blue Shield. And my favorite thing about Oregon summer uh, is probably the cherries and fruit trees and everything blooming. Uh, is Eli on? 
Okay, we're going to go to Colin. Hello. Harris. Oh, Colin, there you are. Oh, Yay. hi, yeah. I'm Colin Stackhouse. I use uh, he, they pronouns, and I'm an independent contractor working most often with Mission Driven Data, which is a mental health startup in Portland. Um, and I volunteer with Healthcare for All Oregon. And my favorite thing I'm looking forward to is seeing my garden grow this year and playing outside. So. Harris. Good morning, I'm Kara Sotomayor Phillips and I'm the Vice President of DEI and Community Initiatives at Moda Health. And my favorite thing about Oregon's summer Portland summers are um, being out with my family loves summer free for all. We get that schedule at the beginning of the summer and try to hit as many concerts and movies in the park for free as possible. Love this, Greg. Hi everyone, my name is Greg Saltlip and I'm the Vice President of Finance at Project Access Now and my pronouns are they, them, theirs. And I like to do a lot of backpacking in the summer. Julie? Hi, Ju uh, sorry, Julie Weller, uh, Director of Global Benefit Design here at Intel. And I don't know about Oregon, but where I live, my favorite thing to do is just hang out in my backyard. So. Julie, come for an Oregon summer. They're fantastic. <laughs> yes, I, I've been up there before. So. Uh, Nick. Thank you. I, uh, I am Nick Powers, the CEO at Winding Waters Clinic, and I'm transitioning off the committee. My term is up, but, uh, you know, you can imagine we, we like Willow Lake in the summer. It's just up the road. So time on the lake with the family in the boat. I believe Nick just all invited us to Willow Lake to ride on his boat for the summer. <laughs> That's why that was my takeaway from that. If you make right, it well, this far, definitely look me up. At the boat. <laughs> well, as you could tell, I love Oregon um, and I love our Oregon summer. I just want to check in. Are we missing anybody? Did I miss anybody from my list? I think Hardesh and Daniel Porter are both on now. Oh, great. Her dad, Ash, introduce, tell us what you love about Oregon summer. <laughs> yes, this is Her Dash Lal, and I am a yes, senior director at Kaiser Permanente for contracting. What I love about, oh, gee, it's a, other than it's a, I love, I don't know what I love about Oregon summer, but I, I can tell you I love Oregon because I get to see Oregon. Fantastic. Daniel? Hey, good morning. This is Daniel Porter. I'm uh, my first committee meeting, but I've been following the work of this committee and its predecessor since the beginning. And uh, I work at Legacy Health and Pair Contracting and Population Health Analytics. And I uh, uh, love the uh, long days of the Oregon summer. Thanks for having me. Lawrence? Hi, uh, Lawrence Frenstall. Um, I'm the CFO of OHSU, uh, transitioning off the committee. Um, and uh, I love um, the ability to bike to work, not in the rain. <laughs> yeah, the weather, real key to the Oregon summer. Am I missing anyone else? Hi, uh, Wade. Oh, hi, Wade. Hi. Uh, I manage our revenue and risk department uh, within our finance division at Samaritan Health Plans. My uh, favorite thing, uh, it's hard to choose, uh, but uh, maybe day trips over to the coast. Uh, so Newport, it's not an all the way from you. That's fantastic. Anybody, any, anybody else? Can we have Dave and Andrew introduce themselves for the new committee members? Yes. Andrew? Where are you, Andrew? Hi. Yep, I'm right here. Hey, hey, okay. hey. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. I'm Andrew Stolfi. I use he/him pronouns. I'm the director of the state's Department of Consumer and Business Services, and the state insurance commissioner. And love everything about Oregon that everyone said. Uh, Timothy Lake's my favorite place, favorite thing, because uh, I grew up out east. Uh, I really appreciate the lack of humidity in the summertime. Thanks. Somebody once told me we don't have very many bugs either, which is uh, Dave. 
Uh, hi, everybody. Dave Baden. I use he, him pronouns. Uh, Deputy Director here at the Oregon Health Authority. Thanks, Felisa. Yeah, like Director Stolfi, um, I grew up on the better side of, of Illinois, the Southern Illinois side. Um, uh, Chicago is this whole different place. I just, it, who needs to be around there? Um, uh, anyway, yes, uh, no, uh, I guess maybe no cicadas either that we have to deal with here, Felisa, for, for this summer. Uh, but yeah, it's, I, I love I love being here um, and just being outside. Yeah, that's great. Sarah? Hey, everyone. Sarah Bartleman, she, her pronouns. I work for the Oregon Health Authority, and I manage the Costco Target program, and I also love being on the water in any capacity. Okay. Am I, am I missing it? This meeting is being recorded, so we need all of these summer ideas. Okay, if you are staff at the Oregon Health Authority, what would be great if you could put your name and what you do, not your title, what you actually do at the Health Authority in the in the chat so that folks could see that and then what your favorite thing about Oregon summer is. So as you can see from this meeting, we're doing some transitioning where we're adding new board members and um, some board members are transitioning off. Um, and so I just want to take a moment to really appreciate and thanks thanks to the board members who have been on over the last couple of uh, years to work through the cost growth target. Um, some folks have been on this through COVID-19 pandemic. Some folks came on right after that. Either way, it has been a real challenge in our state in healthcare, and there's lots of transitions happening. And I really want to appreciate everyone who has shown up to this process um, and participated in this committee, brought their best ideas, brought their best thoughts to this group and really worked through some of the challenges that we've had and, um, and give people a chance if anybody else would like to uh, say or um, as they transition off. Nick or Lawrence? This is Lawrence. This is the first time I've ever heard you be quiet. Come on, jump in here. What do you got to say? Um, well, I just thanks for the opportunity. Um, it's important and great work, and and best of luck. It's been great working with all of you. Yeah, I've appreciated learning a lot about cost growth targets and how more about how the system works. I think I just encourage the committee to continue as our, our committee charter uh, principles say, be sensitive to the impact that high healthcare spending growth has on people. Um, so keep people and patients at the core of this. Um, a lot of people live in fear of the costs of their healthcare. So please keep up the good work. Anyone else wanna add anything? Well, I just want to say that if you transition off the board, I want to remind you that we still have your name, email address, and phone number. And so you may leave, but you're not going anywhere. So we'll just call you anyway for thoughts and ideas. So <laughs> remember that Lawrence and Nick are out there. We can contact them um, as we move through some of the difficult questions. And they definitely work in places where I think it's important to hear from a variety of folks. In the... Um, after the meeting, or I think in the links in the chat, one of the links is an updated committee. So you'll be able to see people's names and bios in the committee. Um, and then I think the next piece of this is we need to co-chairs. Is that correct, Sarah? I think we wanted to ask for nominations today and we'll do the election in June. Okay. So if you would like to nominate someone to be a co-chair of this committee, so I used to have a lovely co-chair named Peter Davidson, who has transitioned off the committee from Pacific Source. The co-chairs of the committee are one of the community members on the committee and one from a health system are typically the co-chairs or are actually required to be the co-chairs of the committee. So um, if you have nominations, um, you can say them now. or you can think about it um, based on people's favorite summer activities and give those to Sarah. 
I also would encourage you to look at people's bios. <laughs> okay, anything else on that, Tara? We will take nominations and they, they can be self nominations or other nominations over email. So if you wanna think about that, um, let us know in the next couple of weeks. All right. So the April summary is online as well. If you wanna take a look back, all of the previous committee summaries are online. If you wanna take a look back as well as the education and training webinars, um, folks have gotten emails about those, but they're all posted online. So you can actually go back and watch them. Um, I think if you are new to the board um, or in specifically interested in a topic, I think it's worth end the pharmacy discussion um, that we had. And I'll think about some others too that might be helpful um, that have been hot topics that I think we're going to continue to sort of talk about as we move through our agenda um, and get those out. And we'll, I'll ask the staff to get those out to people so that we just sort of have a little bit of a foundational grounding. Now are we on to the exciting, I'm doing a terrible job facilitating this meeting. Um, so now are we on to the, are we on to the exciting part, Sarah? Is the now main. the exciting part? New committee members are also exciting, but yes, we're ready for we're ready for the main agenda item. Okay, 2024 cost growth trends. Okay, <laughs> so this is the exciting part of the agenda. Um, so I think that, that we'll move, uh, there's a Christy Baker's in the chat. So we're gonna turn off videos of people that are not presenting an effort to make the bandwidth more manageable and so that we can see the big PowerPoint. So I'm gonna turn off my bit video as well. Um, and Sarah's gonna walk us through the 2020. All right, Christy, can you bring the slides back up, please? All right, I'm full of a lot of regret that we are doing this all um, Tuesday morning after a holiday weekend. That was poor planning on um, my part, but thank you for all bearing with us. And we're really excited that this morning we are releasing the 2024 um, annual cost growth target report. Christy, let's go ahead a few more slides, please. <laughs> Keep going. Keep going. One more. Okay. Next one. There we go. Okay. So as part of the cost growth target program, we are statutorily required to publish an annual report on healthcare costs and spending trends. We have done this for the last couple of years, and we bring this report to the advisory committee to present the data and um, have a discussion about what we're seeing. So I'm gonna walk through um, with help from the rest of the team. We're gonna walk through some of the, the key findings of the report. Um, the report is live on our website. Um, it's posted in the meeting materials and the press release is going out probably during this meeting. So um, it hasn't been officially announced and launched, but it's, it's going to happen um, while we are talking. So this report was published this morning. We are talking about healthcare cost trends between 2021 and 2022. So you all remember probably that our cost growth target data lags a little bit. Um, last year, we looked at 2020 to 2021 and really looking at some of that immediate um, COVID declines in utilization and then a rebound. I think when we're talking about this report and this measurement period, 21-22, we're seeing some continued lingering effects. And I think just wanna recognize that we are sitting here in 2024 and there are lots of things still happening in the health system, but we are looking back at um, data from 21-22 today. In this report, we use two measures to describe healthcare spending in Oregon. The first measure is total healthcare expenditures or THCE. And that includes claims-based spending, non-claims spending, other spending, um, which is sort of everything else we can get our hands on. Um, things like Veterans Affairs, um, Department of Corrections, spending on health benefits, behavioral health contracts, that kind of thing. And then also the net cost of private health insurance, which is a measure um, essentially of admin costs. It's the difference between what payers receive in premiums and what they pay out in claims and non-claims based spending. So we're also capturing that. That total healthcare expenditure measure is what we use at the state level and at the market level. When we're talking about payer and provider organization cost trends, we use a measure called total medical expenses. This is a subset and it's just the claims-based and the non-claims-based spending. So I'm gonna talk about both of these as we go, but just wanted to give everyone a little bit of grounding to the two measures. 
Next. Next slide, Christy. So I just said on the, um, that we, when we measure by market, we use total healthcare expenditures. So again, some grounding, when we say market, what do we mean? For the cost growth target program, we measure three markets. We measure commercial spending, that includes all of the fully health insured plans um, in the state, as well as some of the self-insured health plans, not all. When we say Medicare, we're talking about Medicare Advantage as well as Medicare fee-for-service or original Medicare. And Medicaid is our third market, and that includes both the Medicaid Coordinated Care Organization spending as well as Medicaid fee-for-service spending. And in the report, we have breakdowns sort of within these categories, but broadly, we're going to talk about statewide spending and then market-level spending, commercial Medicare and Medicaid. We also use these three colors, orange, maroon, and green, to indicate each of the markets throughout the report and the uh, data visualizations you'll be seeing today. Next. Okay, so starting with statewide cost growth. Next slide. Statewide total healthcare spending in Oregon, so this is just the dollars that were spent, um, increased just over 6% to $34.7 billion in 2022. So we've increased 6.1% um, in total dollars spent. Next slide. If we look at how that spending breaks down by market, um, we can start seeing the shares of total spending. So Medicare in that maroon bar, totaled um, a little over $12 billion in 2022 and represented 35% of healthcare spending in Oregon. The total dollars spent on Medicare grew 4% between 21 and 22. The commercial health insurance market, that's the orange bars again here, um, that's the second largest market in Oregon in terms of total dollars that are spent. Um, is about 28% of spending is in the commercial market, and that's about $9.9 billion. Commercial spending grew 1.1% between these two years. Medicaid spending in the green bar, Medicaid spending in total dollars is about 21% of all Oregon healthcare spending, about $7.2 billion in 2022, and it grew 9% between the two years. The net cost of private health insurance, that admin cost that I mentioned, um, that totaled 2.6 billion and that was about 7% of spending. And then the other spending in that light blue, that spending in Department of Corrections, Veterans Affairs, um, we've added spending for the Oregon State Hospital for the first time in this report. And all of that other spending on healthcare um, totaled just under $3 billion, um, about eight, eight and a half, nine percent of all healthcare spending. We saw a lot of growth in total dollars in that other spending category um, because we had some increased investments, particularly in behavioral health. Next slide. Okay, so switching gears from total dollars to cost growth as a percent. So we measure both total dollars and costs on a per person per year basis. Um, because that lets us standardize the comparison. If we have more people in Oregon, we would expect that we're spending more money in total dollars. So we wanna standardize it um, per person per year. So total healthcare expenditures per person per year grew 3.6%. So just over our 3.4% cost growth target for this time period, um, sort of spread out on a per person per year basis. This was $9,261 per person per year. Next slide. We talked a lot um, last year in the report and with payers and providers over the course of the year about the importance of not just looking at cost growth as a one-year snapshot, but at looking at the trends over time, looking at sort of a multi-year period, looking at cumulative growth, and really understanding what happened in 2019, 2020 with COVID. So you can see that our cost growth has been fairly similar, um, 18, 19, 20, 21, and 21, 22, hovering around 3.5, 3.6%, just above our cost growth target. We had that drop in 2020, negative 1.2%. Um, and that was where we saw cost decrease because of the COVID-related declines in utilization. So overall, pretty stable, not really seeing a lot of um, 
trend upward or downward um, year over year. I think 3.6% is sort of right ballpark what we've been seeing apart from that COVID year. However, this all adds up. And so cumulatively, since 2018, healthcare costs in Oregon have grown 12.4%. I just don't want to lose sight of that as, you know, it seems like we're, we're doing well, we're pretty close to the target, but also this is continuing to have that compounding effect on, on affordability. Next. So one question that we thought um, you might have is how did we compare as a state? How did Oregon do relative to other states? So the other cost growth target states, um, there are a number of them. Um, some of them have published their annual reports earlier this month as well. And so we were able to pull data from their reports for the same measurement period, 21-22 or 2019-22, to 22, and look at that cost growth trend statewide. So um, four other states have published their reports recently. We can look at Rhode Island, Delaware, Massachusetts, and Connecticut. That first column shows what each state's cost growth target is. Um, they're all roughly similar between 3.1% and 3.8% um, in Delaware. Um, both Delaware and Connecticut, their target changes, it ramps down one sort of each year between those two endpoints. Um, so while all the targets are relatively similar, you can see that the cost growth experience statewide was was pretty different. Um, all states did have that drop in 2020. Um, again, that COVID utilization related decline was a really similar story. And then that rebound in 2021. Um, Oregon is about the middle of the pack here. Um, we had a lower rebound in 21 than some other states, but in terms of overall cost growth in 22, um, again, middle of the pack. Rhode Island's growth was about 1.6%, Delaware's 6.3%, and we're in the middle at 36 So coming back to the Oregon data, so total healthcare expenditures, looking by market. So if we break down that spending by market, um, you can see that all three of the markets met the cost growth target or were below our cost growth target of 3.4%. Medicare's growth between 21 and 2 was 2.2%. The commercial market was 1.5%. And the Medicaid market was 1.2%. What we see is a big increase in the net cost of private health insurance, or again, that admin cost, which grew 8%. Um, their trends in the net cost of private health insurance varied a lot, um, and we have some more information on that um, coming up in a few slides. Next. So again, taking that, um, that look over time, going back from 2018 to 2022, um, you can see that growth fluctuated quite a bit. Um, all three markets, Medicaid, Medicare, and commercial, had negative growth in 19 and 20. They all rebounded in 21, although the rebound looked pretty different. Um, that low cost growth in Medicaid, the lower trends there, is likely due to the sort of surge in enrollment and the pause on redeterminations for Medicaid that was were in effect over this time period. We'll talk more about that as well. So basically we had more people enrolled in Medicaid and so on a per person per year basis, we're spreading the spending out over more people, um, which is um, keeping that growth rate uh, suppressed a bit. Um, between 2018 and 2022, the cumulative growth was highest in the commercial market. Um, cumulatively, the commercial market grew 16% between 2018 and 2022. Medicare grew 6.1% and Medicaid's growth was negative 2.6%, again, likely due to we just have more people in Medicaid these days than we did in 2018. Next slide. Okay, so that was all talking about percentages, but it's also really important to look at not just the percent change, but the dollars spent because we know that the per person per year costs are really different in each of the markets. So here on the slide, you can see the, um, the per person per year total spending, um, total healthcare expenditure spending by market. Um, the maroon bars are Medicare. Again, so you can see Medicare is about 13,000 per person, um, more than twice as much as the commercial and Medicaid in the orange and green bars on a per person basis. So just wanted to put that in the mix so that you know we might be talking about a smaller percent change in Medicare, but it might be more dollars um, because the, the per person per year spending is higher. Okay, next slide. 
So coming back to that net cost of private health insurance, that admin spending. So NCPHI grew um, about 31% for commercial payers and about 46.5% for the Medicaid coordinated care organizations. So this is a payer measure. So we're only looking at the CCOs and the Medicare Advantage plans on the next slide um, when we get there. Um, so slight subset of the market here. Um, and what we're showing on the bars on the left are the total healthcare expenditures on that per person per year amount in the darker bars, and then the net cost of private health insurance per person per year amount in the lighter bars added on. So you can see the overall growth. The line graphs on the right show the trend over time in the NCPHI growth um, compared to the uh, sorry, compared to the total healthcare expenditures. So you can see on um, the Medicaid CCOs, dark green, 1.5% growth in expenditures and the net cost of private health insurance um, bouncing around above that. Same commercial market in the orange bars, you can see this really fluctuates. Um, NCPHI um, bounces around year over year because um, it's related to how well um, payers are predicting how much they're going to spend. Um, as well as what happens with utilization. So if there's higher spending because utilization is um, up, then there will be less NCPHI and vice versa. So this, this um, is much more variable. Yeah, we have a couple of questions in the chat. Do you wanna wait till the end or take questions as we go along? Yeah, let's talk. Um, I can answer Greg's question right now. Um, so does NCPHI include profits as well as admin costs? Yes. It is where profits, so it's everything that's in that margin. Um, it includes taxes, um, other operating costs um, of the health plan and anything that's profit. And then Deb, how can the cost be so much higher than actual spend? I'm not sure which measure, what data point you're talking about when you say cost. Um, if you wanna clarify, we'll come back to that question. Do you mean how come the, the NCPHI growth can be so much higher? Yeah, it's just, they're much smaller dollar amounts. You can see on the commercial market, it's about 550 growing to 805. So that's a pretty big growth rate, um, even though the dollars are smaller. So again, that this is why it's important to look at both the amounts in dollars per person and the percent change. If we just said percent change, that might overstate the case. Next slide. I just want to highlight briefly the um, NCPHI for Medicare Advantage. So unlike commercial and Medicaid, um, Medicare Advantage NCPHI decreased almost 50%. So kind of the opposite story um, in the Medicare market. Um, we think what's going on here is um, the growth in actual spending on services. So when the claims payments that were being made was, was faster in the Medicare Advantage market than in the commercial market. Um, more Medicare Advantage enrollees came back to the doctor's office for care that they had delayed during the pandemic, um, leading to this, this decline. I'm going to stop there and see if um, Sam Smith wants to add anything to help explain what's happening with the NCPHI. Hey, Sarah. I don't think I'm necessarily needing to add anything. I think you nailed it. If there are further questions, I'm happy to jump in. But that is a consistent message that we heard with a lot of the payers and the providers, especially during our regular conversations that we had with them is the acuity, the, the, the health of the actual Medicare Advantage uh, members that were coming in after the pandemic was significantly worse than it was during the pandemic or before the pandemic. And that bled through in a lot of outpatient costs and a lot of hospital costs. So um, I think that was a pretty, pretty consistent message actually. Thanks, Sam. And I want to address what Deb's saying in the chat about claiming expenses. And so I just want to be really clear that when we're talking about measuring payer cost growth compared to the cost growth target, we do not include NCPHI. We use the total medical expenditures, and we're going to show, show that data in a few slides. Um, we don't add in NCPHI, so th they, they don't get to claim their expenses um, because we're not comparing NCPHI to the cost growth target for individual payers. Um, we break it out separately because it fluctuates so much. It's really important to look at it and include it in this, in this presentation to understand the total spending, but it's not part of what we're comparing to the cost growth target for individual payers um, or for providers um, as a pass-through. So I, 
we, when we presented the data last year, the year before maybe, we had a lot of questions about, you know, well, add it on, put it, you know, put these bars together so that we can see the total cost. And so that's what we're doing here. But when we're talking about payer cost growth relative to the target, we do not include NCPHI. Okay, cool. I know I'm going really fast, but I'm sensitive to time and want to just get as much of this data out um, in front of you as possible. So let's go to the next slide and the next section. So in the report, if you're following along in the report, we are now in chapter two. Um, we are looking at cost growth by service category. Next slide. So like I said, we have those two different measures and we're about to switch gears. So everything we talked about previously was the total healthcare expenditures, those dark gray bars, but now we're gonna talk about just total medical expenditures. So only the claims and the non-claims based spending. Um, TME spending only grew 1.5% in this time period. So we're now talking about lower cost growth um, overall um, and as we talk about service category spending. Next slide. So most spending in Oregon is claims-based, and this is true everywhere. I think currently uh, most spending happens through claims payments, but we saw pretty significant growth in non-claim spending in 2022. And that's one of the really important findings that we wanna come back to, um, especially as we talk about payer and provider data. So non-claim spending can include things like prospective payments, um, value-based payment arrangements, capitation, incentive payments, quality payments, um, provider salaries, um, other ways to pay providers, provider organizations that are not on a claim line. So we saw a really big growth, 24.1% um, growth in non-claim spending between 21 and 22, compared to just 3% growth in claim spending between 21 and 2. And again, putting these data side by side so you can see both the total dollars we spend 25 billion dollars more in claims than we do in non-claims but in this time period we saw a lot of growth in non-claims next slide okay so there's a lot going on here um what we are presenting here is what happened by service category um and by market change in per person per year spending 21 22. So we measure um, in a variety of different service categories. So these include the claims-based categories, things like hospital inpatient, hospital outpatient, professional services, long-term care, retail pharmacy. Um, side note about retail pharmacy, all of the data we're presenting um, has pharmacy rebates taken into account already. So we've already sort of subtracted out pharmacy rebates from the data we're presenting. Then in each of the columns, you can see each market. So the statewide growth, the commercial growth, Medicare Advantage growth, and Medicaid growth. So per person per year spending, um, total medical expenditures grew 1.5% statewide. A lot of that was driven by the growth in non-claims-based spending. You can see that bottom row um, across the bottom of the slide. We saw a 20, almost 21% growth statewide in non-claim spending. A lot of that, 84.2% growth in Medicare Advantage. Um, there were a lot of changes in um, Medicare Advantage non-claims payments that happened during this time. And that's really um, one of the drivers of cost growth between 21 and 22. Other um, cost drivers that we really saw um, underlying that increase were hospital outpatient. So that's the second row across the top. You can see statewide hospital outpatient grew 3.7%. Um, although that varies, it hardly grew at all, 0.1% in Medicaid, all the way up to 5.1% in commercial. Um, and then we also saw behavioral health spending grow a lot in 14.2% growth in commercial, 4.5% in Medicare Advantage, and 9.5% in Medicaid. And one thing that we say a lot in cost growth target world and conversations is not all cost growth is bad. Um, and this increase in behavioral health spending is one of those examples. We're really delighted to see this. Um, this is likely due to some increased investments, increased payments, um, things that were happening in this time period. And uh, from, the, from the big picture, when we say, all right, was cost growth over the target? Yes or no. Was it for an acceptable reason? Yes or no. Cost growth that's driven by behavioral health spending increases is definitely an acceptable reason. I'm going to pause here just for a second to see if there are any questions about this slide or the primary cost growth drivers we saw in this period. 
Dental costs are excluded. Um, that's a trick question, Gil. Some of them are included. We are not measuring standalone dental plans, but any dental services that are part of a medical benefit um, or on the Medicaid side are included. Examples of non-claim spending. Yeah, so let's take the Medicaid um, Coordinated Care Organization Quality Incentive Program. So, or any performance incentive program where there's a sort of arrangement between the payer and the provider where if you meet certain quality metrics, you get some sort of bonus payment um, when the data are in. Any of those um, incentive payments would count as a non-claims payment. Another example might be a value-based payment contract. So let's say that you entered into some sort of risk-based capitated arrangement for all of your commercial patients with diabetes, and you agreed to accept a per member per month payment to manage the care of those patients with diabetes. So all of those payments, those per member per month payments for your members with diabetes would be um, considered a non-claims payment. <laughs> Outlier in Medicare Advantage. Yeah, Sam, can I... Um, tag you in on what was the specific non-claim spending category for Medicare Advantage. I know we know it, I just don't know it off the top of my head. Uh, there were um, significant increases in prospective payments and that's those capitated arrangements, those value-based arrangements and Medicare Advantage. And it's important to keep in mind, um, I wanna say uh, that these are percentage increases the underlying dollars are going to be very different between <laughs> Medicare Advantage and Medicaid. Medicaid, um, you know, the the actual amount of dollars being spent in non claims has always has been very high and continues to increase as we've seen for Medicare Advantage and commercial, especially those non claims dollars tend to be much smaller than they are for Medicaid. For example, let's go to the next slide. I think we actually have the change in dollars on the next slide. Yeah, there you go. So yeah, here's so, the change in dollars. It is absolutely important to look at both the percent and the dollar amounts. Yeah, that that Medicare Advantage number can look a little frightening, uh, you know, depending on your perspective. Um, but I think it might just be the Medicare Advantage world, you know, catching back up to uh, the value based world and, and sort of shifting the the payment plan or the the types of payments that they're they're doing in that world. And I want to also add that I think, you know, I, I don't know that I would consider the growth in non-claim spending or in these types of value-based payments problematic or concerning. And I think that is what's happening. There are a lot of really good reasons for this, um, including stabilization payments to keep provider organizations open. Um, and those are all really good reasons for cost growth. So I, I don't know that I would say that this is something alarming or that's something we'd want to see decrease in future years. Um, it's not, I'm going to just pick on pharmacy. It's not the same as growth in, in pharmacy that just is continuing year over year. Um, and then, Felisa, are we seeing an increase in value-based payment contracts? Um, that's a separate question with a separate report it's coming out really soon. Um, I don't want to answer that and get too far ahead. I don't think we heard anything in our payer and provider conversations this year that really indicated an increase in contracts. I think more dollars might be flowing through some of the existing contracts or other payment arrangements, but I don't know that we saw anything on the cost growth side that said there was an increase in contracts specifically. Sam? Yeah, I think you have that right. We didn't hear that specifically, but you know, we'll, we'll, we're keeping our ears open. So if anybody wants to tell that story, we'll, we'll have people listen to it. Um, Charlie's asking if we have a slide on non-claim spending since 2019. We do not have that in the slide deck. That data is available, and I can point you to it after um, uh, in the report. <laughs> okay. Anything else on the service category spending? Okay. Next slide. <laughs> Gil, yes, great question. Okay. So one of the things we did last year was sort of do a crosswalk of payers and providers who, or sorry, payers who met the cost growth target or how did payer cost growth relative to the target compare with their value-based payment arrangements. So I think when this year's value-based payment arrangement report comes out, we'd like to do the same thing. Um, and so that analysis is probably pending. Okay. On the service category side, I want to just show you again some of the differences by market. So 
um, quick orientation to the next three slides of how to read them. So some of you have seen us present the data with these bubble charts before. They're a little complicated. They're showing a lot of information um, all in one visual. So um, how to read these charts. The higher to the top, the closer to the top of the slide that a bubble is, that means the higher the per person cost was in 2022. So you can see which service category has the higher cost just based on their position top to bottom. Then looking right to left, that we are showing the higher cumulative cost growth. So the farther to the right of the slide a bubble is, the more cumulative growth that service category has had since 2018, 2022. The smaller and the larger of the circle size is the absolute dollar change. So depending on what question you're asking, you know, which service category had the highest per person cost, you can look up or down, which category had the most cumulative growth, you can look left and right, and which had the most um, dollar change, you can look, uh, zoom in, zoom out on the bubble size. If bubbles are on the left of the um, axis, they had negative cost growth cumulatively. So, sorry, that was a lot. Hopefully it all makes sense. Let's look at the next slide. So this is the statewide growth um, in that bubble chart by service category. So between 2018 and 2022, statewide non-claims spending in Oregon grew 106%. So non-claims way out over here on the right. Um, they're pretty low though, compared to the top bottom. So they're not that large in terms of absolute dollars um, in 2022. Claim spending in comparison only grew 1.8% in this time period. You can see um, some of our larger bubbles, hospital outpatient and retail pharmacy. Um, this is very similar to last year where we saw those as some of the, the major um, drivers of spending by service category. So that was statewide. Now let's look at a snapshot for each of the three markets. Next slide. So now commercial market. Commercial costs have grown in every category since 2018, especially hospital outpatient and retail pharmacy. Again, you can see hospital outpatients and retail pharmacy as some of the largest bubbles there and also closer to the top of the slide. Next slide. Looking at Medicare Advantage, um, we had cumulative growth in those prospective payments, again, the non-claims payments that Sam just talked about, but most of the Medicare Advantage spending is driven by hospital outpatient services. You can also see a decline in long-term care spending in the Medicare Advantage market. Um, Felisa is asking, does retail pharmacy include drugs administered in inpatient settings? No, it does not. Um, that is what we would consider medical pharmacy. And so all of those drugs administered in an inpatient setting are counted as inpatient. We are making a change in our data collection this year, and we will be able to break out those medical pharmacy costs separately um, in next year's report. Okay, and then last, next slide, um, last market, Medicaid. Um, so between 18 and 22, Medicaid spending continued to move away from traditional claims payments. We see really big increase in non-claims payments for Medicaid. Um, and then many of these service categories are to the left of the line where we're seeing a cumulative decrease in per member spending again, because Medicaid enrollment has continued to grow. So we've increased the denominator um, on spending, which has, flattened or led to negative growth um, on a per person per year basis. And that is where we are for service categories. I wanna just end this section with showing you some comparisons to other states. So next slide, going back to the other states who are also reporting this data for the same time period, um, we can look at Oregon compared to Rhode Island, Delaware and Connecticut, whose reports came out earlier this month. Um, and there's a couple of interesting stories here. Um, so we see really similar trends in inpatient and outpatient compared to the other states, but we have um, lower, lower spending in retail pharmacy compared to the other state. We also have a lot lower spending in long-term care compared to the other states. So we wanted to dig deeper into those two categories. Next slide. So again, now we can look at how the retail pharmacy and the non-claim spending 
changed by market and what our comparison to those other states looked like by market. I've also added in Massachusetts to the slide who didn't report statewide, but reported this data by market so we could add them in as a comparison. So you can see um, our retail pharmacy appears to be lower than the other states um, for commercial and Medicare. We're a little higher on Medicaid. Massachusetts and Connecticut both saw negative retail pharmacy in their Medicaid markets. On the non-claim side, we're middle of the pack here. Um, Delaware had a huge drop in their non-claim spending. And I have a number of questions about why that is and what happens in Delaware. Um, but you can see our non-claim spending was significantly higher than Massachusetts and Connecticut by market. Um, and it's more comparable or less than what was happening in Rhode Island. Okay. Couple more questions in the chat. Um, thoughts about breaking out categories of non-spending and non-claim spending in the future report. They are broken out in the report itself. So I didn't pull it into slides, but in the report, um, both the PDF report and the data book, you can see all of the detailed categories of the non-claim spending. Um, and then Stefan, uh, as value-based payment becomes more common, the change will reduce spending growth in other categories. Yes, um, absolutely. That is a known. Um, that is a known issue in, in this reporting and how do we continue to track? So all of this data that we're reporting here is data that the payers submitted to the cost growth target program. So this is not analysis from our all claims database. That's something that we can do to help understand some of those, those shadow claims that you're talking about. But what we're reporting here is the, the cost growth target data that is submitted specifically for this program and for this report. Okay. We are going really fast and I wanna make sure that we have some time to talk about the payer and provider level data. So Yishan, are you good to run through? Uh, sure, yeah, can everyone okay. hear me? Cool. So hi uh, uh, everyone, uh, my name is Yishan Song Yushiher and I am a data analyst uh, with the Cosmos Target Program. And uh, next slide, please. So today, uh, uh, I'm going to walk through the data, the cost scores for the payers and providers. So first, let's talk about the payers. The next slide. So for payers, uh, all the payers and third-party uh, administrators with at least uh, 1,000 members living in Oregon will submit the data to a uh, cost scores target program. And among these payers, if they have at least 5,000 members in the market, uh, we are included in the report. So uh, for uh, this time period, 20, uh, 2021 to 2022, we include 30 pairs in the report, in which nine in the commercial, 17 in the Medicaid, and 10 in the Medicare Advantage. And some pairs may include in more than one market. So you will see nine plus 17 and plus 10, it's actually higher than 30. And next slide, please. Um, so this is a bar, bar chart to show the TME cost for statewide and also among all the pairs and by market. You will see uh, the cost for the statewide, the statewide TME. It's actually different from uh, the, the, the rate for all pairs. That's because for, all for the pairs, we only include the one with the 5,000 members. And also for pairs, we are using the demography adjusted PME. But for the statewide, we don't do the adjustment. So that's why you see the difference here. And uh, among uh, and among all these uh, three markets, uh, Medicare Advantage payers have the highest cost loss between the measurement period from 2022 to 2021 to 2022. And out of uh, uh, the next slide, please. And out of uh, the 30 uh, payers statewide, uh, we do see uh, 19 of them met the cost force target for at least one uh, market. If we look at the bar chart on the right, we will see for the Medicaid, uh, three pairs that they, they didn't meet the target, which means they, ex they, they exceed the target. And in Medicare Advantage, four pairs didn't meet the target. And for commercial, there's one pair who didn't meet the target this year. And next slide, please. 
so um so for sorry can, can we back a little bit for the, the previous slide sorry so when we said uh mean uh, met the target didn't mean the part so what do we mean when we um met the target didn't meet the target and indeterminate so uh to determine if a pair meet the target or not we calculate 95 percent uh confidence interval so if the entire 95 percent confidence interval uh, below uh, 3.4 percent, and we say this pair met the target. Um, we can go to the next slide to show that. Maybe it's more clear. So, like uh, organization uh, B and Z uh, and E, you will see they met the target because the bar it's it's below the uh, 3.4 percent. And if the entire uh, confidence interval above the 3.4 percent, like organization A. And organization S, then we will see it's a uh, exceed the target. If the confidence interval intersect with the target, like uh, organization C, D, and G, then we will say they are indeterminate. So um, in the future years, a payers and provider organization must exceed the target with the statistical confidence, which we say the 95% confidence interval before we could potentially be let being held accountable. And in commercial, uh, the next slide, please. So in commercial, only one pair uh, didn't meet the target, which is regions, and all other eight uh, pairs are either met the target or indeterminate. And for the commercial co uh, cost scores for the pairs, it's ranged from a uh, negative 2.2% uh, to uh, 70 uh, to 73 percent and next slide please so let's talk about the medicare advantage uh, uh for the medicare advantage the cost growth range from negative 9.3 percent to uh 11.6 percent and out of these 10 uh medicare advantage pairs four of them may exceed the target which uh, are kaiser moda regions and united healthcare Next slide, please. Uh, so for Medicare, CCO, and open cars, there are uh, three CCOs is with the target, which are Aventis, uh, uh, Advanced Health, Cascade, and Health Share of Oregon. And the Medicare cost growth range from negative uh, 4.9% four, uh, to 11.8%. And I just want to jump in and clarify that when we're talking about payer and provider cost growth, we are reporting met, not met, and indeterminate as our sort of data point statistical categories. Um, this report does not include any information about why each individual payer or provider met or did not meet the cost growth target. And as those of you know, we've been going through accountability rulemaking this spring, and we have a list in rule, um, in draft rule, that of the, uh, the acceptable reasons for cost growth. And as that rule is finalized, we will be going forward and meeting with all the payers and providers who exceeded the cost growth target and confirming what the reason was for it. So I just wanna acknowledge that we are um, we're reporting today met and not met, but we don't have the details on why and whether or not it was for an acceptable reason or not that is coming um, as part of the next phase. Sorry, Ishan, keep going. Thank you, Sarah, for jumping. Yeah. And yeah, uh, so let's uh, for the peer powerful uh, these three markets. Uh, can we move to the next slide, please? So uh, although we haven't really had the uh, deep conversation about the reasonableness, uh, but uh, we do have uh, the data validation through the payers and providers, and we do hear some of uh, the reasons of the cost drivers from uh, uh, the payers' perspective. So uh, one of uh, the reasons is, uh, is still uh, the post-COVID uh, period, like we do see like increased uh, utilization uh, of care, for example, like more office visits, uh, more cancer treatment and more elective surgery, which lead to the increasing utilization. So we do see the cost increase in this time period. Also, we still see the high cost in the re uh, retail pharmacy, as you just see in the previous slides, uh, that makes some of the pay fix the targets. 
Another reason is a uh, uh, number of large plants related to trans transplant cancer treatment and gene therapy. And also we do see some of uh, the large claims in retail pharmacy as well. And there's a one Medicaid payer experiment that increased the spending on the behavioral health, uh, on the behavioral health investment. So that's, again, uh, not all the costs are bad, bad, and we do want to see uh, the increase of the behavioral health spending uh, by the first day. And next slide, please. So let's move to the provider organization. Next slide. Uh, for public reporting, uh, we include provider organizations with at least uh, 5,000 attributed patients, which results in uh, 53 provider organizations in the report between uh, 2022, uh, 21 and 22. It if we look at the provider organization by market, they are 21 in commercial, or 15 in Medicaid, and uh, 13 in Medicare Advantage. For provider organizations in commercial and Medicaid, we group them into a large size, which is more than uh, 20,000 attribute patients, and medium size, which has uh, 10 to 20,000 attribute patients, and small size, which has fewer than 10,000 uh, attribute patients, but more than 5,000 patients. And we also have the pediatric practices and FQHC, which are um, many in the Medicaid market. Um, next slide, please. So similar to the cost force by peer uh, provider organizations also have the highest cost force for the attribute uh, patients in the Medicare Advantage, which is 4.6% as you see in the bar chart. And uh, you will, pro you will also find these numbers for the provider organization is slightly different from uh, what you see in the payers because for the provider organizations, uh, we exclude the pharmacy rebate. We also, uh, so for, you can consider the provider organization is actually the subset of the payers because for the provider organizations, we only include the, uh, the organizations which has at least 5,000 uh, attribute patients. And next slide, please. Uh, so out of these uh, 55 or uh, 53 provider organizations, uh, here's the title for the pair, sorry. Uh, there are 29 of them met the target at least one market. If you look at the bar chart on the right, you will uh, see uh, 12 of uh, Half of the provider organizations uh, in Medicare that exceeds the target, and the seven of them in the Medicare advantages that exceeds the target, and five of the commercial provider organizations they exceed the target. Next slide, please. So um, let's start with uh, the provider by market and by group. So first we are looking at the commercial cost growth for the large provider organizations. Uh, for this group, uh, the cost growth range from 0.4% to 6.8%. And out of these seven uh, provider organizations, two of them exceed the target. They are Oregon Medical Group and Providence. Next slide, please. And here is the commercial cost growth for the mid-sized uh, organizations. The cost growth range from a uh, negative 1.8 to 8.6%. And one of them exceeds the target, which is uh, Salem Health. Next slide, please. And for uh, the commercial market, uh, for the small uh, provider organization, the cost growth is ranged from negative 2.1% to 10.1%. And one provider organization, they uh, exist target, which is Summit Health. Uh, next slide, please. And now let's talk about the Medicare Advantage. So for Medicare Advantage, we're gonna do a grouping as you see uh, for, the Medi uh, for the commercial. So for a Medicare Advantage, uh, the provider organization's cost growth range from negative 14.9% to 8.2%. And six of them exist the target, which are Asante Health, Kaiser, 
Legacy House, Providence, Samaritan House, the Colvarus Clinic, and the La Pauline Clinic. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so now we are moving to the Medicaid cost growth for a large provider organization. The cost growth ranges from negative 3.5% to 4.3%, and number of them exceed the target. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, here's the mid-sized provider organizations uh, in the Medicaid uh, market. The cost growth is ranged from negative 8.0% to 10.8%, and two of them exceed the target, which are North Spain Medical Center and the Sky Lakes Medical Center. Next. And here's the small provider organizations in the Medicaid market. Uh, so uh, the cost growth is ranged from negative 8.8% to 19.9%. And one of them exists a target, which is Columbia Clinic. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so now we are moving to the FQHCs. Uh, they are mainly in the Medicaid. Medicaid market. Uh, the FQHC's uh, cost growth is ranged from negative 5.7% to 13.8%, uh, and three of them exceed the target, which are Clark Mills Health Center, um, Manoma County Health Department, and the Valley Family Health Care. Uh, next, please. So the final one is the uh, pediatric practices, and we we separate into the commercial and Medicare, as you see by the color on the left and on the right. Uh, so for commercial, the pediatric, the cost growth is ranged from negative 14.2% to 27.7%, and one of them exceeds the target. And for uh, the Medicaid, the pediatrics, so the cost growth is ranged from negative 3.2%. 0% to 22.9% uh, and five of them exceed the target. So that's, I think that's all for the provider. Oh, we do need to, the next slide to mention about the reasons. So we do hear a lot of like from the provider organizations when we uh, do the data validations with them. We do hear like similar story as we met with the payers, the utilization increases. Also, the expanding services, we do hear a few uh, provider organizations that mention they expand their uh, cancer treatment. They have the new cancer center building in 2022. And we also, as we see in the previous slide, increasing the non claims. And we do hear that uh, the, we do hear that uh, uh, provider organization, especially in the Medicare, in the Medicaid uh, market, they do receive uh, the non claims from uh, the CCOs. And uh, these are actually, uh, sorry, so these are actually, uh, uh, they receive additional quality payments on sharing set, uh, savings from CCO into 2022. And these payments are actually related to the COVID. Or, or like the uh, vaccination clinics. We also hear about the behavioral health spending increase, hospital rate increase, and we especially hear from the pediatric practices, the pediatric triple damage, which is COVID, flu, and ISV, the increase. So they increase the treatment to uh, the utilization in this uh, respiratory disease, and that's why we do see the cost course growth in the PDH practices, and that's all. Thanks, Yishan. So as I mentioned, um, we've heard some themes uh, from payers and providers about what those cost drivers were. We've included those themes um, narratively in the report. And as part of our process, as the rule, the accountability rulemaking is finalized, um, next month, we will be um, having additional conversations with those payer and provider organizations who exceeded the cost growth target to determine um, the reason why. I think what we were talking about in the rulemaking conversations were 
um, was putting out a separate report. Um, so that codifies the sort of over the target, what was the reason, was it an acceptable reason or not? So I think that's something that we're still developing and there may be a follow-up report for this same measurement period later this fall. And I think we are done dumping data at you. So are there questions? Um, Felisa, where do you wanna go next? Christy, if we could take down the slides so that we um, we might have to pull them up later as people ask questions about them. But um, first of all, I want to say there's no one formally signed up for public testimony. Um, but if you do want to do public testimony, please reach out to uh, Remy Watts um, and she can get you signed up or um, put it in the chat and hopefully I can get you in. Um, we have about, you know, I think this is a lot of information very quickly and we release it on the same day you saw it. So I know that <laughs> there's going to be a lot of questions and follow up um, that are going to sort of come out of this as we've gone through it. Um, I think most of the questions in the chat have been answered, but let's start with questions and then um, and then have a discussion about key takeaways. So I'm gonna give it, are there any questions to start with? And people should feel free to come back on video if you're able to um, during this time period too, or just come off mute is the other to ask questions. I'm not seeing any hands for questions right now. Are there any takeaways that people sort of had looking at the data? Nick. If, if I may, I have a. Oh, Nick, you went back I on you. There we go. <laughs> yeah, sorry, I was trying to lower my hand, got the wrong button. Um, I was wondering about um, where does it talk about, help me understand, are there more details about like the cost share for, for people's out of pocket expenses? And deductibles, and I'm sorry if I just missed that, but where, where is that information or when will that be published again? So this report does not include um, the breakout of what sort of percent or dollar amount of these numbers was the patient cost share. We did publish a couple months ago now a patient cost sharing analysis that looks in much more detail by market and by category. And I think you can look at those sort of side by side, they're not directly the same data. Right. Um, I think that patient cost sharing report is something that we plan to continue to refresh. And so we can look at that. Um, but it, but as a direct subset of this cost growth data, we don't have that. We know that the data we're reporting are inclusive of the patient cost sharing amount, but we're using those other analyses and that other dashboard to track it. And okay. we'll drop the link in the chat for that dashboard in a minute. Yeah, no, and I've, I've seen, I think it was February that it was published. Um, I guess I'm also wondering, one other question was just, um, uh, what is OHA doing to try to get as current information as possible available to the committee and to the public? Because I think, you know, what I'm seeing and in, in working and talking with patients is that their cost share is in continuing to increase significantly year over year. And I think the more outdated data uh, or, or the more up-to-date data we have, the better we can advocate for. Um, controlling costs. I just think it's really important to have updated data systems or systems that can, you know, get information out more quickly than two years ago. Understood. And I think that is an ongoing challenge slash criticism. And there are a number of conversations about data sharing in more real time. And some of those facilitated agreements between payers and providers, some statewide initiatives and projects to help improve that on the health information technology side to get more real time access to which patients have been attributed. And um, for the patients on, for which I've entered any sort of contract, um, what's the data on their utilization like looking like over time. So I think there are efforts to increase that data sharing that is not sort of under the cost growth target, not to play not my job, but I think um, th they're related, but I think that the cost growth target, um, we are only ever collecting the cost growth target data annually and it lags. So we have to look at some of these other structures and other initial help fill in those gaps and get to the more real-time data. Uh, Teresa? Yeah. Um... 
Well, first off, just want to say that it's a, an amazing report, a uh, really nice job and great information, really rich and lots to think about. So thank you for that. Um, and uh, one, I, I feel like I should know the answer to this, but um, is are the per member per month costs risk adjusted at all? Or that comes in more when we look at acceptable and unacceptable reasons for high growth? Because it, it actually could also determine someone could look like they're low growth right now, but actually when you risk adjustment, it could flip them on the other side. So remind me. Yeah, so the data in the cost growth target program is not risk adjusted. It is demographically adjusted um, for age and sex changes in the population. And in the report, you can see the breakout of the difference between the adjusted and the unadjusted growth. That is not the same as risk adjustment. So just clarifying that there is demographic adjustment, but not risk adjustment. Mm. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah, thanks. Um, really? I thought I saw your hands. Too. Yeah, I was just going to comment similar to the um, first person who spoke. I, I mean, I think this presents a very rosy picture of how things are. And we know we're still kind of stabilizing post COVID. And I know 23, particularly high growth year, 24, high growth year, at least for commercial side, 25 projected to be the same. So um, I, I think that there is some value to trying to bring the data up and and I can't remember if we're looking at change in the cost growth target amount or we're gonna I can't remember where we landed on that um but I mean I think you know it's it's gonna be a very different picture next year I would expect um so just things to you know things to think about as we're if there's anything more that we're looking to make decisions on going forward it just seemed to be an awfully rosy picture which we all enjoyed 2021 <laughs> so but you know, we're 2022 going forward. It's definitely um, costs are accelerating for sure. Great. So I just put in the chat also that the advisory committee will be revisiting the target for 2026 and 2020 to set it. So I um, I think I would add to your sort of comments, uh, Julia Brown, and sort of it is a comment with the combination with Nick is like the cost growth target is one piece, the out of pocket and the premium payment and the other payments is another. And what people are experiencing may not be lining up, frankly, around these two items if you look at the reports. Um, I want to raise up uh, Michael's comment at as well around sort of his sort of thoughts around, you know, this sort of right sizing investments um, and where those investments are. I think one of my key takeaways, uh, you know, around the equity, maybe invest a pair investing in equity is a, a payment that actually reduces. I think Stefan also, this was one of his comments earlier as well. And one of the key takeaways, right, is if we're moving to more value-based payment, and I'm going to butcher this, so Stefan, feel free to jump in with your own words here. If we're moving to a more value-based payment, and we're seeing those the growth in that non, um, I forget what it's called now, but the sort of non, um, God, I'm blinking on it. Anyhow, <laughs> the, those uh, those payments increase. What we could be seeing is a decrease in the other payments, right? Non-claims-based payments. Thank you. Non-claims payments. Increasing, we could be seeing that compression in the other sort of types of payments on the claims base of those value-based payment risk sharing. So that dollar amount adjustment is really is really critical. I think my other takeaway, um, and I think Gail's pointing this out, the non-claims based payment growth and the medic the Medicare advantage, if we sort of saw that compression in others. One of my other takeaways here is the dramatic increase in the behavior real health spend I think is um I think really critical for meeting sort of our our community at the moment and its needs around some of these other things that hopefully will it is a sort of a increased spending and it's an up a lot of it is an upfront infrastructure ending and so hopefully we'll see a decrease in some other spending or reduced acuity is my wish for our hospital workers and our hospital partners, frankly. <laughs> um, I think one of the one of the concerns that I had when I looked at this data um, is the decrease in long-term care spending 
when you look at the sort of eight, the combination of an aging population in our state, as well as the fastest growth in our on our houseless population or seniors, we're seeing a big decrease in long term care spending, and so that I would love if the um, if the staff could dig into that a little because I, I think that was actually a concern. That was pretty concerning to me. I understand our relative sort of spending related to other states because we have more community-based care, but that that level was pretty, I was surprised by that. So I don't know if there's, if you all were surprised by that or if there were takeaways from that from the staff who've spent more time with the data. take takeaways from this a decrease in long-term care spending in Medicaid last year as well. And it was something we poked, kicked the tires on. So I think given that we're about to be at time, I would encourage people if there are other questions about the data or if there are things that you want us to take a closer look at or come back with maybe an explanation or more details, send us an email and we can package some of that up and bring it back to you at the June meeting. Um, but we'll we'll put the long-term care question on the list. Thank you. Thank you. So I think we are at time and I, um, we should email Remy or Sarah, <laughs> Remy, <laughs> we should email, oh, there we go, healthcare.costtarget at OHA organ of. Um, Stefan, I'm sure they will give you all of the data and the dashboards that you want and love so much. <laughs> and I'm excited to see you right now. So I do want to say that I know that this is a quick, like, thrown up first time people seeing the data. If we could use this email to sort of email our thoughts and our general um, questions, et cetera, other data questions, et cetera, to that. Um, I do want to remind people of the public hearing that's coming up um, and making sure it's going to be held um, on, oh gosh, I don't have it in my notes, June 4th. I don't have my calendar up right now. So it's going to be held at June 4th in the morning um, and it is in person. So making sure people are 800 Northeast Oregon Street. Um, so that's next week. I hope to see you all there. And I feel like this is another opportunity where we're going to hear from a variety of people. Um, and so it I think it's gonna to add to the discussion and the richness of the discussion coming up in our next uh, round of work plans. Um, you can see our upcoming topics on the webpage. Um, if you wanna go take a look at those, think about the data that you we've had today in that, and then think about how we're coming up with or advising on those topic areas based on the data that we've seen and what we're gonna hear on June 4th. Again, I want to thank everybody for coming to the meeting. Um, so, and I'm going to run through our list of takeaways. Co-chair nominations need to go to the healthcare.cost target at oha.organ.gov. <laughs> uh, ideas or general thoughts also need to go to that email. Questions about the data need to go to that email. You are coming in person June 4th to 800 Northeast Oregon if you were able to um, and take a look at the upcoming topic agenda items. So not a lot to do. Um, with that, I'm going to adjourn. Since I don't have a co-chair, I'm just going to adjourn this meeting, I guess. <laughs> so thank you all. And I really appreciate everyone for coming. Thanks, everybody.